So I'll, I'll say your name and then we can begin. Archie Laundry, October 27, 2000, at the WCG TV studios in Brandon, Manitoba. Can you tell us your name and what your role was in the war? Well, my name is Archie Laundry, and uh, during a large portion of the time of the war, I was a flying instructor. Where did you grow up, Archie? I grew up in the Minidos area. What did your family do? Farmed. You farmed? Did you have family members who enlisted and served? No, I was an only son. You were an only son. Mm -hmm. So what led you to enlist in the Air Force? Well, I guess because I was too lazy to walk. No, I was interested in flying. What year did you enlist? I enlisted in 1941. You were 18? Did you just well, come of age? No, I had to. Um, being a farm boy in the Depression, uh, education was a little hard to come by, and I had taken my grade 9 and 10 by correspondence, and I had to go back and take further education that was required for air crew at that time, and uh, so I, I had spent a period of time that. A little later on, the, what they called what was the wet pee course came in, that was wartime emergency and training plan, where the, uh, education could be updated. That was, but this was prior to that plan being instigated. So where did you go to enlist? Winnipeg. Winnipeg. And what did they tell you there? Well, I don't think they told you very much of anything. Uh, you were sent home for a while and, uh, until things, uh, you know, and then you were called up afterwards. And uh, you went back to Winnipeg, and from there I was shipped to Edmond and to Manning Depot. Uh -huh. What was your first impression of Manning Depot? Well, uh, at that time we were housed in the old horse barns, and I guess... Uh, Maybe the discipline was the big change. Air, uh, actually, with I think particularly as as prospective air crew that our discipline. I think the idea was that they tried to break you there if you were going to crack up. Uh, they wanted it done before they spent too much money on you. So the discipline was pretty rugged. How about the lack of privacy? Well, you just forgot about privacy. It didn't exist. When. You, when you're naked in a lineup of a hundred uh, or so, uh, there isn't much privacy left. And with uh, the, your big shot of inoculations, your TABT and that, uh, there were quite a few fellows that would actually uh, pass out you know, watching the needles ahead of them. So they just did them on the floor and you kept on going. You walked over top of them. And, and did you handle all the shots OK? Did you get sick at any point? Oh, no, I was never sick. I, I was never on sick. I was only on sick parade once in my life in the Air Force, and uh, that was another different story. It was, I was issued a pair of secondhand boots, and I complained about them, and I couldn't get anywhere. So I went on sick parade, and I got an order from sick parade, and I had to go back to quartermaster stores and get a new pair of boots. That's the only time I was on sick parade. What was the daily life like at Oh, that's 60 years ago. Well, a lot, it was mostly discipline, marching. Uh, you were up early in the morning and et cetera, and you were, you were trained with marching and rifle drill. Uh, one of the things that I thought was very useful for air crew, we were taught how to uh, uh, bayonet drill, carve up sacks of hay with old World War I bread knife bayonets. I thought that was awfully useful for air crew, but I guess that was... Uh, I think that was discontinued <laughs> shortly after. Um, were there men from other countries there? Did you have? Uh, uh, not at Manning Pool. Well, no, uh, the uh, the most of the from other countries, uh, they had their their Manning Pool and from the. Um, the, the RAF boys, some of them came over here uh, for ITS, but it was mostly they had, a lot of them had even done their elementary, well, not so much RAF. The uh, Australian and New Zealanders, uh, they had done their elementary flying, 
uh, before they sent them over here because of the, the, the cost and whatnot. If they were going to be washed out, they tried to get as many eliminated before they sent them this far. No, I don't. <laughs> Probably six weeks, maybe a month. Maybe a month would maybe be closer. So from Edmonton, where did you go next? Well, to uh, initial training school, ITS at uh, Regina. We were in the, the old normal school at Regina down by Wascana Lake. So you'd have gotten there in the fall of, of 41, right? Yeah. The October, August. Yeah. Well, uh, when you enlisted, you enlisted as air crew and you put down your preference. And right from the start, uh, that is what you were hoping to be. Like, I suppose probably 90% of the enlistments of air crew put down a preference of pilot. But then as they were, as you were sifted out into other trades and whatnot, they went to, well, the next, uh, uh, the next preference was really observer at that time. That was before it was con changed to to uh, bomb aimer and navigator, the, that, uh, the old observer, the old, old wing. So how did they sift you? What kind of testing did you go through to determine what you would become? Well, I guess your, your ITS course was a general course. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, navigational training. Uh, not, not flying, just, it was strictly a ground school at, at ITS. Uh, you did some link training. The link trainer eliminated a, a lot of them. You got a, couple, a few hours in the link trainer, and if you didn't have any coordination, that eliminated quite a few there. Do you remember your first time in a link trainer? Uh, I do remember that it was one of the toughest aircrafts to fly that I ever flew. It's just a flight simulator for people that don't understand what a link trainer is. but. Uh, it would stall and spin and, uh, and do, just do anything that you could do in the air. Like your instructor, link trainer instructor, uh, applied these different things from a desk, and there was a, a crab on the desk that ran on a chart and it showed everything you did while you were in the link trainer. But I, I think it eliminated more people from as pilots than anything else. Was it extremely sensitive, Archie? Did extremely you? sensitive, yes. Hmm. Far much more so than an aircraft. Oh, well, you, you, it, it was uh, say it was general. You, you studied uh, navigation, meteorology, armament, uh, um, pyrotechnics, uh, bomb aiming, uh, gunnery. Uh, it was just a, a real sort of a, a general class. You, uh, that was where you. Uh, uh, maybe did more of your uh, uh, firing on anywhere from handguns to machine guns. Still lots of marching? Uh, yes, there are not, any, not anything like Manning Pool, but you were, I think, about 6 o'clock in the morning, you were out on parade. You, you uh, were on the parade score, and then you were marched to breakfast. And yeah, you were marched everywhere from each place you made a move, you were marched there. At ITS, your time off, um, perhaps I was uh, in a little different situation than, than most of them. Most of them there were from uh, either university graduates or from university, for I probably had to do more studying the other. But my time off was mostly spent studying, and it would be often until 2 o'clock in the morning or so before you actually uh, felt you were ready for the next day. Uh, no, you did, you had one final exam, and that was that was for an awful lot more. Where weeded out was in that final exam. So how long were you in Regina? Any idea? Oh, probably another six weeks. Um, and did you know by the time you left Regina, where you were, did they tell you ahead of time um, what 
they thought you might become at ITS? Uh, well, yeah, from ITS you were posted. Uh, to uh, like if you had any hopes of carrying on as a pilot you were posted front to an elementary flying training school from ITS and they told you looks good you may be a pilot we're going to send you well you, you just you knew by your posting that was about it you weren't told much you were just okay. you were just posted one place or another right. so where did uh, you head to uh, I did my elementary flying at Verdon right. flying tiger moths No, uh, you spent half half of one day flying and the other half of the day in ground school. You alternated. You were an ins an instructor would have four students, and he'd have two of them in the morning flying and two in the afternoon, and the two that were flying in the morning would be in ground school in the afternoon, and vice versa. Do you remember your first flight? Oh yes. Well, you didn't do much of anything. It was just a familiar, familiarization flight. But uh, a lot of our, our, most of our flying instructors had uh, elementary flying, were old bush pilots and whatnot. My first flight, I remember it quite well because the instructor was uh, trying to knock over a, a coyote with the undercarriage of the aircraft. And so it was quite interesting when you hadn't been flying. Oh no, I never was air sick. Never. No. Um, how many hours with an instructor before you finally could fly solo? Oh, about eight, seven or eight hours. If you didn't, if you didn't go solo by ten hours, you were finished. Remember your first solo flight? Mm-hmm. How'd you feel out there by yourself? Oh, uh, good. <laughs> Well, yeah, you had to feel you had to feel comfortable, or you shouldn't be there. Really, that's yeah. about it. Yeah. So by this point, it's winter on the prairies, isn't it? Yes. How did the weather affect flying? Uh, very much. It was. Uh, we were flying these tiger moths with no heaters in them, and when it got down to about thirty below and thirty to forty below, it was a very cold. And in fact, uh, some of the RAF boys that were with us that weren't used to that had very difficult times. In fact, one, uh, and we knew enough to beat our hands around to get some circulation going and whatnot. You, you know, you'd hold the stick with your knees and beat your hands around a bit. And one chap, one RAF lad, hung on to the stick so much that his hands froze around it. And uh, when we were posted from there, he was still in the hospital with anticipation that he might have to have his right hand amputated from gangrene. Yeah. That was an extreme case. But it, it, then once in a while your oil lines would freeze up and burst and splatter over your windscreen, so you'd had to stick your head out and, and uh, you know, make a, a landing, a forced landing with your, your head out. This didn't happen very often, of course, but that's the extreme cases. Oh, yes, uh, the, the Tiger Moths were a very forgiving aircraft. It all depends what you call a crash. There's a difference between a crash and a forced landing. There were aircraft down in different places because of weather. There's no doubt about that. But Um, yes, I think perhaps we did. We had more time there than at the EFTS, but you were still, you were still straining. You were still in ground school, and you, you, uh, you know, really had to keep keep up with things. But yeah, you, there was a little more uh, social life. There wasn't much on on the station. I, later on, there I think there was a bowling alley and a swimming pool and whatnot put in at Verdon. But at that time. There wasn't any uh, of that, and the, uh, we used to go downtown and theater, and uh, there were times we even did a bit of skating on the on the rink in Verdon at times. But that was most of what the recreation. There wasn't much recreation on the station 
old films once in a while. Yeah. Had you been able to go home at all since you had enlisted? Uh, yes, you uh, you usually. Uh, uh, well, let me see. You got one. Uh, how did I get it? No. Um, you, you, you could get a 48-hour pass if you were close enough to go home on that. But uh, I think it was after uh, you finished ITS, uh, I think we got a, a week after ITS before we went into elementary flying. How were your parents doing on the farm without you? Well, uh, that was... Uh, you know, they did have to have help and whatnot. And actually, with if, uh, in fact, the farm boys, if there were one one boy on a farm, you were pretty much encouraged not to enlist because of the farm supplies that were needed so badly. So, uh, but then later on, uh, with after conscription was brought in, and uh, the, I guess. We used to call them zombies, like the non-combatant conscriptions, uh, conscripts were sent out on the farms to do farm work, particularly in harvest time and whatnot. Yeah. Did you get letters from home? Did your mom write to you? My mom wrote very regularly, and she wrote letters up to 16 and 18 pages. I don't know how she ever did it. but. Yeah, she was she was a letter writer, which I I wasn't. I got a note back once in a while, but or a, I guess on a regular basis. But no, she wrote tremendous letters. What happened at Christmas time that year? Were you able to go home? Uh, no. Uh, that year, I I think I was home for New Year's that year. Half uh, about half the course, you did get uh, forty eight hours, and I was close enough to go. To go home, but I, I don't know. I don't think I was home at Christmas. I was home at New Year's. I think that. Do you remember Christmas at Verdun at all? Then do you remember if you did anything not, extra special? Not not too much. I remember one Christmas later on very well when I was by a long chain of circumstances I was doing orderly officer on Christmas Day, and I remember that one very well. But maybe we can go into that later. Sure. Where did you go from Verdun? I went to Dauphin. Dauphin. Yeah. Did my service flying training at a dolphin. Uh, the planes you flew on change? Uh, well, that's when we went on to twin in engine aircraft and Cessna cranes. Yeah. How'd you find the Cessna in comparison to the Tiger one? Uh, the Cessna was a good training plane. We used to call them the bamboo bombers. They were, you know, they were very light aircraft, uh, cheapest thing that could be built as far as an aircraft was concerned. But they were a good training plane because they were uh, they were light and much more difficult to fly properly than, say, for instance, the Anson. Some of the uh, service flying training schools had Ansons, but later on, uh, when I was flying both and whatnot, uh, I, I realized that the Cessna Crane was actually a better training aircraft, and, and it was the same thing with the Tiger Moth. I think in, in the fall of '42 or something. Uh, the Fairchild Cornells were brought in as an elementary trainer. And uh, later on, as a flying instructor, when he received a student, you could tell within the first half hour whether he'd done his elementary flying on a Tiger Moth or a Cornell. The, the, the Tiger Moths were a much more difficult aircraft to fly properly. Hmm. Cornell was very easy to fly. Was it a good thing then that you started out on the Tiger Moth? Yes. Yeah. No, it was. Anybody that ever flew tiger moths, they never forgot them. They were the most, uh, you know, they, they were they were underpowered. Actually, we just had the old Gypsy Major motors in them, and about 145 horsepower. But they were they were very nice. It was something like a good question. You have to be part of a horse, and to fly a tiger moth, you had to be part of the aircraft. Uh, you still spent, uh, it was the, the same thing, you still continued ground school courses and you, you spent half your day flying and half the day in ground school. Yeah. Anything bad happen 
Depends what you call bad, I guess. Uh, one instance I remember uh, very early on uh, night flying. I had just landed and I was just turning off the runway when I saw the exhaust and clearance lights of an aircraft coming in and land directly behind me. And I guess the thing that shocks people now, uh, in, uh, in the, those aircraft we had no radios and uh, your uh, well, for instance, not so much at night time, but the daytime, there could be 20 aircraft in the circuit at once and maybe three on final approach. And there were very, very few accidents. But at this particular time, this, there was a student on his first solo fight and he had been coming in too close behind. And when I was just turning off the runway, when he saw me and uh, I saw him coming, so I opened up to full throttle to get out of the way as fast as I can. But he, when he saw me, he did evasive action in the same direction. He was flying at full throttle and hit me broadside. And it kind of, it, the one motor chewed the wing up to pretty well to the uh, cockpit and, and that swung the aircraft around so the other motor chewed off the back of it. But uh, actually, uh, neither one of us were hurt very badly. and. Uh, we both were able to run when we got out of there because you went like scared rabbits before you hoped they wouldn't explode, but, which they didn't, but that was, but neither one of us were hurt really, but it was, that was an interesting incident, I guess. Was either plane salvageable or? Oh, they were salvageable for parts. Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, most any plane was salvageable as far as, uh, you know, they were, once maintenance got a hold of them, they, they, I don't know whether they were both back in the air or not. We really didn't have anything to do with that. They pulled them apart with a couple of tractors, really, and went from there. So how long were you in Dauphin? Mm -hmm. Oh, Dauphin would be between two and three months, I guess. Do you remember the date of your graduation? No, I don't. <laughs> do you remember the day? I remember the day. Do you remember the day? Yes. Well, it, uh, your graduation, that's when you got your wings. That was a big deal, and uh, you were be able to invite company. And uh, my parents were there and another friend that I'd gone to school with. The one thing I do remember about it was that I was pretty perturbed. Uh, with the, the CEO gave quite a stirring address, and, and I thought with parents there it was a horrible thing to do. He got up and he said, well, you know, from now on we've taught you how to fly and how to be careful. He says, from now on, it's kill or be killed, and go out and kill ruthlessly. And I thought that was one heck of a thing to say with a bunch of parents there. But I re that's the one thing that stuck in my mind about graduation. And at this point, your expectation was that you would be heading overseas, or did you know? You, you didn't know at the time. You put down your preference. That was, uh, that was where you... Uh, on, uh, you know, prior to graduation, you you were given a a, a preference list of uh, what you would want to do. Whether you wanted to go to fighters or bombers or or uh, overseas, and uh, I, I also there was flying instructor on the preference list. But I don't think anybody ever put down a flying instructor as a preference. So what happened next? Were you able to go home for a bit? Yes, we got. Uh, Two weeks. Uh, actually, it was, I guess in a way, it was called embarkation leave. And then we, after we come back from that two weeks, we knew what we, where we were posted. How did you feel about being oh. a flying instructor? Uh, not very happy. No. <laughs> and um, do you remember how many in your graduation class would have become instructors and how many would have gone over? Well, there were there were three. Uh, okay, all along the line there were washouts all the way. Like if you started out with a uh, a group, uh, I guess I suppose about uh, thirty percent would end up graduating. Of the ones that started on the start, and maybe a little more, but. Uh, I guess, uh, as I mentioned before, I think the reason I ended up as a flying instructor was because it was dumb. 
you went, uh, didn't, uh, you were so afraid of, of uh, being washed out that you kind of did your best. And at that stage of the game, if you happened to end up in the top five or ten percent of the class with an above average logbook endorsement and a preference for overseas, you were invariably jolted into being a flying instructor. And later on, I think that was changed when there were more instructors. Uh, it was supposed to be only for one year, and then you'd get an overseas posting. But three years later, I was still a flying instructor. So where did you instruct? Well, I, I instructed a good portion of the time at number 12 SFTS, which is in Brandon here. Well, Cessnas, and then later on, on uh, when the standard beam approach or, or beam approach training, uh, we flew Ansons on it and with radios in them. I did a little bit down in in uh, Napanee, Ontario, down at Deseronto, flying out over the bay there. But most most of the time up here. Yes, you 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 took you were sent to a flying instructor's course from uh, after uh, graduating from service flying training school. How long would that last? Oh, about another month, I guess. Yeah. What kind of things did you have to? Oh, you were supposed to. Uh, you were given a patter book, and uh, uh, we had to, um, a lot. Of, you were you were. A lot of the stuff you learned there, you learned how to forget about it afterwards, too. But the, there's the standard pattern book that gave you some idea of how you were to go about instructing and whatnot. And of course, you flew different types of aircraft there, too. So what was the average day like as an instructor? Were you up in the air most of the time? Uh, we usually flew about six hours a day. Um, particularly with the new course of students. As you got more of them doing more solo, you maybe flew less. But yeah, we, uh, your flying time was supposed to be limited to 100 hours a month. But uh, you flew about six hours a day. And you would work with the same batch of students? You got four students as they come in when you were, when you were doing uh, regular flying. You got a course of four students, and you flew two of them in the morning and two of them in the afternoon, and alternately they were in ground school. Then later on, I was doing a little more specialized instructing in, in instrument, on uh, instrument flying, and then after that, I went to uh, beam approach training, and that way you. Uh, you flew everybody's students like you didn't have a regular course of students. You just flew students as courses came along, and they were they were sent to you for that part of their training. Did you enjoy instructing? I don't know really. I'll just how you would describe enjoy. Um, actually, you. Uh, when you were there, you had to do your best. I mean, your students. You had to turn out a student that was capable of, of. Uh, being in charge of an aircraft, it wasn't only his life, it was particularly going to Bomber Command, which mostly of the twin engine went to Bomber Command. And if he wasn't a capable pilot, uh, the life of the whole crew was in danger, not only in himself. And that's where, uh, I guess the difference between, how would you put it, uh, I think cautious instructors turned out poor students. You had to let a student get into every possible mess that they could get into as far as in trouble and let them attempt to recover on their own before you would take over. And uh, because if you took over too soon or, or too often, it just uh, ruined their confidence. And then the other thing, that's why there were so many casualties among flying instructors, because there was only a fraction of a second between when a student couldn't recover and when anybody could recover. And I, I think that's where, see, there were a lot of people don't know that there was over 850 casualties in training in Canada, and uh, that was the main reason why. For you, were there many scary moments up in the air where a student was not in control and you had to take 
control and get out of a bad situation? Do things like that happen? Oh, that was a very common occurrence. Yeah. Actually, a lot of these boys didn't realize that they had never even driven a car before. Uh, back in the 30s, uh, people just didn't have, you know, unless they were from a farm family, they didn't even have a car. And uh, they'd never driven any more than a bicycle. So to go from a bicycle to an aircraft was quite a change. No, if, uh, at least uh, I don't think any student should have graduated that wasn't a competent pilot because I mentioned before it wasn't only their lives that are at risk, it was the entire crew. No, I, I never graduated a student that I didn't feel that I had taught to the very best of my ability and that wasn't ready to carry on. It was all RCF. The only civilian instructors we ever had were at elementary flying schools. And later on, they were all replaced by uh, RCF instructors. <laughs> how many, do you remember how many instructors there were versus students? No. Uh, Quite a few. Yeah. Oh, yes. There, uh, um, well, there's, there's students, I guess the ratio was four to one, uh, really, uh, and uh, or maybe uh, a little more than that, because when they went on to the special uh, courses, see, you t actually you taught them how to fly very uh, cautiously first, and then at the last month or so of their course, we took them over to a relief field where we actually did operational type flying, uh, a lot of low-level flying, and uh, a lot of bad weather flying. Uh, actually, when when there were accidents, you were criticized for that, but you know they didn't learn to. Uh, uh, when they were overseas to fly up river beds and and whatnot, uh, if they'd never done any low flying, you know, to avoid uh, radar, or the weather was not always good when they were coming back from Europe to to fly in good weather. So there were a lot of accidents because of of weather and low flying. Or I shouldn't say a lot. There were some, and you know, sure criticized well, you shouldn't have known that weather. But the weather wasn't always good there. Yeah. How was the morale of the men? Oh, mostly it was good. There's, there was one incident that probably is, uh, it's a story that's never been told. And as far as I know, the only uh, mutiny that there ever was in the RCF uh, during wartime was right at number 12 SFTS. There was a very undesirable type of a station sergeant major. He was a real disciplinarian, and I guess a lot of him, he was just known as a regular SOB. He was about what it was. And uh, uh, he certainly didn't do anything for station morale. In fact, one night a bunch of the boys had got him on the bus, and they beat him up so badly that he was hospitalized. And uh, uh, actually, there was quite a to-do about that. One of our fellows, one of the instructors, was on the bus at the time, and he was up before the CO the next day and asked why he didn't stop it. And he said, well, how are you going to stop it? And he said, well, use the authority of your uniform. He said, what, they think the fellows are really crazy. The authority of uniform is going to be. And he said, besides, if I'd have done anything, I would have helped them. So that was a little bit. And there was another instance just a, uh, after he was hospitalized for a few days and then he was back on the station and that's when the mutiny occurred. The one morning every enlisted man and woman on the station just sat down and refused to obey any orders. And of course that was mutiny. And I guess if you come down to the fine thing, uh, the, the maximum penalty for mutiny during wartime is the firing squad. So uh, that was really what happened there. To give you one instance, of what he was like. Uh, there was one day when our ground crew uh, that was servicing our flight 
uh, went to four of the boys were going over to the canteen for a coffee break, and he caught them going over. They were in their fatigues, and he sent them. They were back in about three minutes, and I said, what happened? And he said, the sergeant major wouldn't let them go to the canteen in fatigues. And so I said, uh, you go right back out there and go to the canteen. And I said, that's an order. And I said, I'll be right behind you. So actually got there, but I guess the sergeant major didn't do anything when I was there, but I guess he got the word to the CO, and uh, as a result, uh, this was in the fall, and I come, or late fall, and come Christmas time, I found myself on DROs as orderly officer for Christmas Day. That was one of the things, uh, the repercussions of that, and which was a very interesting time. Um, but uh, another repercussion from it, uh, not too long after that, uh, I was, uh, um, when I was flying, I had gone to beam approach training flight, and uh, I had a student out at night, and uh, about two or three o'clock in the morning, uh, we had radio trouble, like we were flying the beam. Incidentally, that, uh, that beam approach was the forerunner of, of beam flying in, in aviation, really. There's a lot of things developed out of wartime, and this was one of them. Anyway, we, uh, I was back, our radio went on service when I was back trying to uh, tune in the radio to get something, and in the meantime, we'd missed a general recall. The weather had been a real bad front turned in. And uh, so, when, as I was there, uh, the, uh, um, you could f I felt something happening, and I got back to the cockpit fast. The, the old TR-90 sets were further back in the aircraft. By that time, we had one motor iced up and it lost it completely, and the other motor was iced up and down to about half power, and the wings all iced up, so we had no option except to maintain flying speed to prevent from stalling and lose altitude to do it. So we had to do a forced landing, and we uh, managed to hit a spot where we uh, got a bit of a clearing before we went into the worst part of it, and actually nobody was hurt at all, and the aircraft was maybe pretty badly the worst of wear, but uh, the following morning I was called into the, uh, or at least I had to report to the the squadron commander and the, the chief flying instructor, and they commended me for managing that kind of a landing under those conditions, which uh, was fine. And then about three days later, I got word, uh, for, well, uh, from the DA, BM, which is the Deputy Assistant Provost Marshal that the CO wanted to see me, and, and uh, he wanted to charge me with, the charge was neglect to the prejudice of good order and Air Force discipline. And uh, I pleaded not guilty to it, uh, so I was court-martialed. And uh, he, he brought in the, the best lawyer that the Air Force had, I guess, and uh, Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, I, I beat the rap and was found not guilty. But I think this was just a repercussion of, uh, of the uh, backing the boys up on a, a bad sergeant major. Incidentally, with the sergeant major, I don't know whether I mentioned or not that he was posted after the, after the uh, mutiny and to the next station, and very shortly after he had been posted there, he had an accident which proved to be fatal. So uh, that was, a lot of this was, has never been uh, on the record, and I guess maybe I shouldn't be telling it now, but it is an interesting story. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Were you in Brand until the end of the war, weren't you? Uh, yes, uh, well, I was in Brand, yes. I had a, uh, I was scheduled for the, the Japanese theater, until the A-bomb was dropped, and that was the end of that. So I, I was actually in, in Brand until the end of the war. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember VE Day? The I VE do, Day? yeah. Anything in particular happened? Were there celebrations in town that you went into? Uh, actually, on, on VE Day, I just happened to be on leave. We got an annual leave, and uh, I happened to be on leave, and I was... Uh, actually with my girlfriend at that time, which I remember very well, and she later became my wife of 54 years. So I, that's the one thing that I remember about VA Day. 
uh, uh, not as much as most people would have, because I wasn't in on the big celebrations. We had a very quiet celebration by ourselves. Did you meet her and Brandon? I know. Uh, we grew up together. Uh, we played together before we went to school, and we went to school together, and uh, about the only time we were separated, uh, she, was, she taught school all through wartime, and, uh, and then we were married in July of 46, which was the marrying us month in Canada, I think. The school teacher, the boys were out of the service, and the school teacher finished teaching school at the end of June. So I think there was more, more marriages recorded in that month than in any other month in the history. Well, I think our thoughts at the time were to get away from it. Uh, it was, you know, you had options, but uh, most of us, uh, I think, felt that's, that's one reason, you know, as far as the Air Training Plan Museum, uh, that's when we should have been storing some of these aircraft, and, and uh, you could buy them for $100 then instead of spending uh, 100000 to restore them now. But, uh, it, it took about 40 years to, uh, uh, before you really, this struck you that this really should be preserved and, and what we've done with the museum up there is to, uh, it's dedicated particularly to the memory of the, there were like, there were 130,000 pilots trained under this plan and there were over 18,000 of them that were killed, 18,039 that, uh, I shouldn't say that, there were a total of 18,039 that lost their lives during that period. Some or other weren't actually killed in action. But that is what the museum is dedicated to the memory of those and also to attempt to preserve a bit of history for future generations so they, they might know something of what went on at that period of time. I don't think so. There's, I could tell stories <laughs> for another week if you wanted them, but I think uh, I don't think you want to take that much time. Find another time. Well, thank you. Thank you for talking. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yay. I think you got a note to wind it up. Pretty. Yeah, sorry. I